Hello, today we're continuing with our series on nuclear physics, looking at a nuclear fission reactor design. In the last video, we looked at the principles of the design. Now we can look at more detail. Just to remind you, the principle is that you have nuclear fuel rods, um, which will contain uranium-238 and uranium-235. The uranium-235 is usually only about 0.7% of the total natural uranium. The rest of it is uranium-238, but you can enhance that or enrich it to produce about 3% uranium-235, but it's still a small proportion. But that is what is fissioning. That is what is producing the energy. The water is used for two purposes. Firstly, it's the coolant. You pump it round and that takes the heat away and the heat can be used to produce steam. Steam can drive turbines that can drive generators and produce electricity. But the water is also used as a moderator. It slows down the neutrons produced by this reaction to produce further thermal neutrons that can cause the reaction to happen again. All covered in the last video. These are cadmium control rods, usually cadmium. cadmium. They are placed in position to restrict the number of neutrons so you don't get the thing getting out of hand and blowing up. You just get a nice steady reaction. So what are the options? Well, one option is to pump this water in under pressure. And if you do that, the pressure would be something of the order of 100 atmospheres. And if you do that, then the boiling point of water, which is under pressure, will go up from 100 degrees centigrade to about 300 degrees centigrade. So you pump in high pressure water, which gets heated to say 250 degrees centigrade. So it's not boiling because the boiling point now is 300 degrees because it's under pressure. And so you've got boiling water or rather water coming out at 250 degrees, which you put through a heat exchanger and of course Anything that's at 250 degrees will boil ordinary water that isn't under a pressure at all and produce steam. And that steam, of course, can be used to drive the turbines. And that is called a pressurised water reactor, PWR. I said in the last video that some people use heavy water instead of water because the hydrogen atoms can absorb neutrons to produce deutrons. So you get ordinary water converted into heavy water and that takes some of your neutrons away. But if you put heavy water in here in the first place, then even though there is a probability that that deut deuterium, heavy water deuterium, will absorb a neutron to produce tritium, another isotope of hydrogen, the probability is much less. So some people put heavy water in their reactor and then it becomes a pressurised heavy water reactor, PHWR. A further option, of course, is just simply to put the water in, not under pressure at all, but just put it in, let it boil and take steam out at the top and the steam immediately goes and drives the turbines. And that is called a boiling water reactor. It's just ordinary water, not under pressure. You allow it to boil, you take the steam out at the top and you let that drive the uh, you let that drive the turbines. There's a further option, um, which is essentially to take the same principle. Here is our uh, uh, lead-lined, concrete-lined container. We're going to have our uh, uranium fuel rods. We're going to obviously have our control rods coming down. We're going to have. Um, this time, instead of putting water in, we're going to put gas coming in, usually carbon dioxide. So the gas comes in, is heated up, and hot gas comes out at the top, and that can be used to boil water to produce steam. And usually, as I've said, you use, say, carbon dioxide as your gas. But the gas is now only being used to take the heat away. You need something else to do the moderation and what is often used for a moderator in this system is graphite, which is a form of carbon. And that is called an advanced gas cooled reactor, AGCR, advanced gas cooled reactor, the earlier version of which was called a magnox. 
So there are some Magnox reactors left, which are early versions of this advanced gas-cooled reactor. Now we've shown how uranium-235 is what's called fissile. In the presence of a thermal neutron, it will produce these fission materials, more neutrons and energy. Uranium-235 is not the only thing that will do that. Plutonium-239 is also fissile, as is uranium-233. But these are rare commodities. You cannot go out and dig them up. But you can make them. And here's the way you can make them. We know that a neutron can indeed be absorbed by a 238 uranium atom. And that will produce uranium-239 in an excited state. But that will not fission. That's 92 down here. That will not fission for reasons we've told. The, ex the, the energy of the excited state is not enough to get over the activation energy. So what does this do? Well, it de-excites to start with and gives you off a gamma ray. Well, that's no use. But then it will be to decay because it's unstable. So it will be to decay to 239.93 Neptunium. And that too is unstable. That will be to decay to 239 Plutonium. In each case, a beta decay, beta minus decay, changes one neutron to a pr proton. So the total number of nucleons doesn't change, but the total number of protons increases by one. So, inside our ordinary reactor, where of course we had nuclear fuel rods, uh, which contained uranium-238, but that wasn't doing much good because it's the 235, which is fissile. Nonetheless, when neutrons are absorbed by uranium-238, they can go through a process which will deliver you another fissile material, plutonium-239, and that is called a breeder reactor. Sometimes called a fast breeder reactor because the advantage is these neutrons can be fast neutrons, you don't have to slow them down. So you can have fast neutrons producing plutonium fuel. In other parts of the world, there is a preponderance of thorium. Thorium is thorium-232 and it has 90 protons. And once again, that can absorb a neutron to produce an excited state of thorium, that would be 233 thorium, with 90 protons, um, which will, and let's put the excited state, and the first thing that will happen, of course, is it will de-excite, it will give off a gamma ray, that's no use to us, but it will then go through beta decay again, and beta decay doesn't change the number of neutrons, it just changes a neutron to a proton, so that goes up to protactinium, protactinium, which has 91 protons, and that will decay by beta decay, to 233 uranium. So that is another fissile material that can be produced. So if in your reactor you put some thorium just sitting there, then the neutrons that are being produced as part of the nuclear reaction, as part of the uranium-235 reaction, some of those neutrons can be absorbed by the thorium to produce a process that will eventually give you another fissile material, uranium-233. How are nuclear power stations used around the world? In the United Kingdom, we have 16 reactors that produce one-sixth of the UK's electricity supply. 14 of them are advanced gas-cooled reactors. One is a pressurised water reactor and one is a Magnox reactor, which is an early version, as I told you before, of the advanced gas-cooled reactors. So here in this country, you can see, overwhelmingly, we've gone for the advanced gas-cooled reactor types with just one pressurized water reactor. In the United States, they have 100 reactors, of which 65 are pressurized water reactors and 35 are boiling water reactors. So you can see how different countries have selected different types of technology, different parts of the world, of course, in other countries, choose different things again. 
and uh, but that just gives you an idea of where we are um, at this stage. Of course, the absolute dream is not a nuclear fission reactor, but a nuclear fusion reactor, and we shall learn about that next time.